Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode 150 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. My name is Barbara. 150, Barb. Wow. (laughs) Three years and 150 episodes later, and we are still rocking it. Still doing it. We don't hate each other yet, as much as we (laughs) thought we would. (laughs) (laughs) That's correct. And I do agree. You are correct. (laughs) Just a little bit. So is it cold where you're at in uh, Chicago? It's Indiana. Again, oldest joke that's not funny anymore. (laughs) Continuing. Good job. Good job. Actually, this weekend we hit a high of 13. Oh, man. 13 degrees. I'm not even running in that. That's just nuts. That's just... That's crazy weather. It's crazy. It's treadmill weekend for me. (laughs) Well, you know what's going down in Tampa this Sunday, right? Uh, Tampa Bay Bucks and the Chiefs. Super Bowl. You know, my happy is going to be watching that. Yeah? You're not going to go? No, I'm not going to go. I think the tickets are like $29,000 I saw online. (laughs) $29,000 to watch something that's on TV? Yep. Crazy. But I'll be watching it. So what's the city like? Are they expecting a lot of people? Yeah. Yeah, there's a fair amount of people, a fair amount of license plates that are out of state. And it's been good, though. Everybody's wearing their bucks jerseys today at work and we're all ready i'm not a big sports fan but i find it interesting that this is the first time a team that's in the super bowl gets to play at home like the first time ever that's crazy yeah man i'm booting for the bucks you know it yeah good thing they didn't have it in indianapolis this weekend it was uh, 13 degrees (laughs) (laughs) the first conference of the year is kicking off march 26th to the 27th Our good friends of the Dental Laboratory Association of Texas is going to have a in-person meeting again. Fantastic. They just had one last October, successfully pulling it off. And now they're doing it again, just months later. It's going to be bigger and better. Located in Grapevine, Texas, this year is going to be jam-packed with education and vendors. Unfortunately, Barb and I will not be able to attend. But just like the show in October, we're going to be hooked up remotely. We'll be set up at the Argon booth. There'll be a laptop with some speakers and a microphone. So if you're planning on attending the DLAT conference, make sure you come by and talk to us live, not live, at the DLAT meeting. And if you're not going to go to the conference... You probably should, because it's the first one of the year, and if we all start going to these, we'll show the world that they can have them again, and we can all get back to the way it used to be. So head over to DLAT.org to register for the first Dental Laboratory meeting of 2021. So what's happening this week? A while back, a good friend and past podcast guest, Jason Kaiser from Kettenbach, reached out to us and recommended a guest for the show. When he told us the name, I almost felt stupid that we didn't have him on sooner. We had the extreme pleasure of talking with Dr. Mark Murphy. If you've ever seen him speak, you know him because you didn't forget you saw him speak. He's that good. Oh, yeah. Mark comes on the podcast to talk about his history with dentistry, dental labs, and now sleep devices. So if you want some facts that are going to keep you up at night, Mark's got them. But he's also got a solution with the company he now works for called Prosomnus Sleep Technologies. So join us as we chat with Mark Murphy. Hey, Barb. I called Oradent the other day about their P5 milling machine. Super. How did it go? I was introduced to the consumables Oradent offers, such as Delta Zirconia, Oradent ZR, Oradent Cutting Tools, and Quest PMMA. How convenient. You know what? You can buy the mill and the materials from them. Yeah, if you think that's convenient, you can also buy furnaces by Napertherm and vacuums by Renfert. Plus, I don't have to talk to a different person every time I call. I have a rep dedicated just for me. I have heard that their service is amazing. Absolutely. Oradent offers high-quality cutting tools made here in the USA, and they have great options for zirconia. Delta Zirconia, which is a super cost savings for labs, 
and Orident ZR made proudly here in the U.S. of A. Do they still offer dental alloys? You know, Orident started off manufacturing alloys and will always provide high-quality alloys for dental labs, one of the few companies in the U.S. to still manufacture their own alloys. Is there anything that they don't supply dental labs? Actually, they also offer dental scanners and a 3D printer from Shining 3D. Hold up. Does that scanner have its own design software? Actually, Orident offers ExoCAD for your designing needs. Nice. I'm not the best with technology and setting up all of this equipment, just saying. Well, we know, but that's <laughs> fine. Orident has a technical support team who can help with installing or troubleshooting any problems. Wow, Orident definitely is a one-stop shop for any dental lab's needs. How do we get in touch with them? You can always call our friends at Orident at 1-800-422-7373. Or you can visit them at their website at Orident.com. We super appreciate your support of the podcast, Orident. Thank you so much. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. Yeah, you sound amazing, so I think it's going to go great. Sounds like we have a really good connection. Sound amazing. I am amazing. <laughs> Yes, you are. It's getting I'm deep super now. Excited. That's how we're going to start it. <laughs> Ego. So, Ego. Uh, we're happy to have on the podcast today Dr. Mm. Mark Murphy. How are you today, sir? Elvis, I am great. I don't hear the doctor quite as often nowadays. Uh, once in a while, a patient. I, I work a half day a week still doing some stuff. So uh, most of the time, I just hear Murph Doggy Dog or Hey Mark or <laughs> some things that I don't want to say on the air right now. Well, hey, you. <laughs> What is a doctor doing hanging out with a bunch of dental technicians? What's up with that? Wow. That's uh that's a story that goes way back to uh wow, let's see, today is uh it's we're twenty twenty one, right? So yeah. twenty twenty one twenty one twenty one and a half years ago, that's what that's what it goes back to. Wow. So in the year two thousand, you were a dentist practicing and what? What happened? <laughs> yeah, so it actually started in nineteen ninety nine. So yes, in the in the year two thousand the the change occurred. But in nineteen ninety nine I'm practicing dentistry and I'm teaching at the Pankey Institute and I'd been a lab technician before I was a dentist. So i I'd always had a soft spot for the laboratory side of stuff, loved working with acrylic and everything. And so there we were and I was uh, doing a, a two-day presentation, actually, a lecture for a small group that had formed. The lecture I did was up in Calgary, Alberta, and the lecture was for a study club that uh, some students of mine from the Institute had had me up to do. Mm -hmm. And the study club had gotten a lab to sponsor it, and that lab had just been purchased by one of the lab roll-up conglomerates called DTI at the time. Oh, yeah. It was about yeah. DTI's fourth lab. I think they had uh, a couple of labs in Vancouver, one in uh, Washington State, and this was maybe their fourth lab, third yeah. or fourth lab. And so the big question to me was, hey, are you okay still coming up and doing a lecture and having it be sponsored by lab instead of by the study club? And I said, oh, hell, I don't care who's signing the check. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> it's a check's a check, man. Yeah. And back then it was a for me, it was a pretty big check back then, so it was 21 years ago. So I went up there and did this lecture, and, and there were some some cats there in the back that were nice, and they came up and talked to me, and they were associated with the lab group that had bought it. Mm -hmm. And we had a nice snack afterwards and met with them and everything, and they said, hey, we'd, we'd love to have you back and do one of these in Vancouver. And so right after the turn of the year, I came back and did one for them for their Vancouver lab, which was called Apex Dental Lab at the time. And by the way, that was Brad Patrick's lab up in Calgary, Alberta, if you know Brad Patrick. Oh. So that, that's whose lab it was at the time. He had just sold that to uh, DTI. And so now I'm up in Vancouver doing it. And it's another day and a half program and it goes great. And I'm teaching a lot of pankyisms and occlusion and all the stuff I like to teach back then and practice management, mixing it all together. And I meet with these same cats from this lab group afterwards. And I'm having a little snack with them and a beer afterwards before I fly home that night. And they say to me, we really uh, liked your presentation. We liked the way you approached education. We'd love to have you come on board and design a continuing education program for our group of labs. Wow. And I said, well, oh, I'd be happy to. So I, I went home and put together some stuff on paper and made them a proposal. And they said yes. And 12 months later, I was uh, working with their then president, Darren Lemke. The CEO mm -hmm. was Paulo Kala. And then Wallace Schuldice was their uh, chief operating officer. And I was working with them. I had responsibility after about 12 months for the eastern half of the United States looking for labs for them to buy. Mm, wow. And uh, so Darren would take the west half of the U.S. and Canada. I'd take the east half. And over the course of the next couple of years with them, I bought about seven or eight labs, 
with and for them. I did the uh, original evaluation introductions, due diligence on financials, due diligence on the ownership and the quality. Wow. And then we'd come in and detail all that stuff at a higher level and then, you know, make an offer. And we bought labs. And we bought a lot of labs that are still part of the DTI today. And those people are all pretty much still really good friends of mine. You still practicing at this time? Uh, yeah, one or two days a week. Oh, because wow. I, my original my original goal was I was working three days a week and I had an associate and everything was great. And I wanted to go to maybe two days a week and maybe lecture 10 or 12 times a year. And Elvis, Barb, that's that's how I was going to ride this pony out. I was going to be a dentist a couple days a week, be an educator a day or two a month, and have a ball. Well, this thing flip-flopped on me very quickly. So within a couple of years, I was the VP of operations for DTI, and they'd grown from about 4 or $5 million in revenue to about $40 million. Mm. Wow. And I was living in the corporate world. I remember sitting at my first meeting with them back in 2000 and people talking about words like EBITDA. And I'm like, what the hell is EBITDA? <laughs> and, I know that well. I'm on the internet at lunchtime looking up EBITDA, thinking it's a word. Yeah. And it's, a, it's an acronym, of course, for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And now I speak that spoke. I'm fluent in that oh, spoke. Yeah. So I spent a number of years with DTI until about 2005 and a half. And in a moment of while they were uh, getting ready to transition and sell the company, ownership, it, it changed a little bit. And the ownership wasn't as much fun to work with as they yielded their influence. But I, but I wasn't going anywhere. I had some stock and I wasn't going anywhere. Hmm. But the Panky Institute was in trouble and they needed some help. And they uh, asked me to come down and help the Institute. They knew they couldn't afford the kind of salary I was getting paid. So I took a pay cut and went down to Panky. So I left DTI in the middle of 2005, actually, and went down to Panky for 18 months and turned around their enrollments. And then a very peculiar thing happened. So now I'd gone from uh, being a dentist to living on the lab management corporate side of the business in the world. And I loved it because I loved it, the people there. My wife said the very first meeting we're at, we're in Vegas. Paris, oh, uh, yeah. Center, if you recall, we're one yep. of those old meetings. I'm meeting people like your father, Barb, and yep. I'm standing in the back of a room and a guy comes up to me and says, Hey, how's it going? And I'm looking at him. He looks really familiar. It's Jim Gladwell. And he's talking to me like I'm any other <laughs> friend of his. And then he goes up on stage and gives the most incredible presentation. And my wife, as she's meeting all these people says, Oh my God, I love this. I go, what? She goes, these people are like real people. <laughs> They're like, oh, yeah. they could buy and sell most of the dentists we know. But they're so much nicer to be around and cooler. And we just fell in love. I fell in love with the lab industry anyhow. I'd, I'd been part of it. And uh, we fell back in love with it. So we spent the next 20 years in and around it, still in a way, in, still in a funny way I am today. And I've, you know, done stuff like, you know, donated to the Foundation for Dental Laboratory Technology. I've, uh -huh. you know, been on the NADL board for a year. I, I, it was a tough year for me because I was so busy that year. But, but it was fun because I left that role with DTI, went to Panky for a year and a half and came out of that job and did not have a job. That was kind of interesting. Yeah. And I was a little nervous. And so I started consulting for dental laboratories because I'd had this expertise from DTI. And I went out and I would work with some individual dental laboratories, uh, teach them some business management, marketing, you know, uh, who was the profitable uh, managing for profit in a dental laboratory? Who was the gentleman who wrote that historical book? Oh, gosh, the name is, forgive me, Managing a Lab for Dental Profit. Oh, somebody will. There's a book on that? Come, yeah. No one told me there's a book on that. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's written in hieroglyphics. So that's the problem. But, it, but So I would do that. And, I'm, and I made more money that year than I'd ever made before in my life. Wow. Self-consulting. Yeah. Wow. So I did that for a couple of years. Didn't, didn't have any interest in going back into dentistry. Did that for a couple of years. And then uh, by then, DTI had sold. Microdental had bought them. HealthPoint Capital owned Microdental and DTI bought Beckden. Uh, they bought an implant company as well and, and sold that off eventually. And they asked me to come back. And so I went back in a consulting role with them. That became exclusive, ended up their VP of sales for a couple of years. And then clinical education, I was trying to slow down. So clinical education for them for a while. And then one of their departments, uh, we had a great removable department. And inside that department, a group of us had launched a new product called the Micro 2. It was a sleep and snoring device, a class 2 medical device. And so in 2016, after this long run on the lab side, we decided when they sold Micro Dental to Modern Dental in 2016, we rolled out the Micro 2 product as a new company called Prosomnus. And uh, Lynn Liptak, who was the um, oh, yeah, CEO, I know him. Yep. and Lynn, who was the CEO of Micro Dental when they sold to Modern, asked me to come with him. And so Heather and I, uh, who were working together at Microdental, went over to Prosomnus, and that's where I've been since 2016, and been in a couple of different roles there. Right now, my role is clinical education director. It's a full-time position, and then I, uh, I'm advantaged to practice a half day a week doing 
dental sleep medicine so that as their clinical director, my hands are wet doing what we teach and tell other people and how to do it. So I'm board certified now in dental sleep medicine. I teach and lecture about that. So I'm not really on the dental laboratory side right now, but I'm in a piece of a dental laboratory that rolled out as a medical device manufacturer, making sleep devices, class two medical devices. And that's where I live right now. That's wow. pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. So I want to know about sleep medicine. Can you kind mm-hmm. of segue into that a little bit? Like, Yeah. The final thing I would just say about that story yeah. is I wish I could say, and that was my plan because then I would look really smart. <laughs> if I could say, and I had this plan and I executed A to B to C to D, and here I am today at G&H and I. But instead, wow. what really happened was I had no plan. Shit would just happen. Things would just jump in front of me. And I, I seemed to walk through the right doors and I seemed to be the right people. I, I often talk about Paulo Kala and Wally Schuldice and Darren Lemke back then. Those three people, they had no business giving me the authority to do the things I did. None. (laughs) It was dangerous to say the least. And yet I did them. And apparently they worked out okay because that company grew and we did well and our stock did well. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing with microdental. Uh, Kim Bradshaw brought me into microdental and I had no business being a VP of sales. What the hell do I know about that? And we killed it. We turned that business around and I turned around Panky. And so, I don't know. I just, I was thrust into some situations that were weird to me and I, I listen to other people's advice and I and we seem to do some pretty good things and, and it's all turned out okay. So I've been very fortunate. Yeah. So what do you want to know about dental sleep medicine, Barb? Oh, I want to know exactly what the device is that you guys created in sixteen and then yeah. segue into how you teach it and just the okay. whole thing okay. fascinates me. Well the device is interesting because we were the first company to mill a sleep device, a, a medical device out of a control cured puck of PMMA. Yeah. And I love it because I can I can talk to you and I can use all the right terms and you'll understand yeah, you know, yeah. picture in your mind exactly what I'm talking about. Multi-access mills and we've got, oh my God, I can't even tell you, but we have a lot of them, let me just say, and they go 24-7. And so we've got all these mills milling pucks. And so we took an industry that was handmade, artisanal, yeah. Yeah. salt and pepper, polymethyl methacrylate construction with sometimes a metal tube called a herbst arm, sometimes a jack screw device so you can make a dorsal device, you know, any other kind of mechanism like that. Uh, one other company, ResMed and, and Panthera is still around in the U.S. Uh, they're mm-hmm. up in Canada, yeah. actually, but makes a printed nylon device. So they, they had entered the CAD CAM side of the business. But what we saw the opportunity to do was to mill out of acrylic because the printed nylon is so porous, stains very easily and gunks up pretty quickly. And so patients had trouble wearing that. And then all the handmade devices were very inaccurate, not precision, a lot of problems with fit, a lot of problems with monomer leaching, a lot of problems Mm -hmm. with uh, tooth movement, things like that. And so Prasanna's really set out to do it differently. And, you know, we were inside of a dental laboratory that had been transformed in large part by Lee Culp into a very, very digital production mindset. You know, we wanted all digital inputs. We didn't have that. So we took analog inputs and immediately were converting everything at the receiving door into digital so that we could uh, scan and mill Emacs like crazy. We were At the time, we were the number one miller of Emacs in the world, and, uh, and they loved us for that and sold us a ton of, uh, of that stuff. So we wanted to have the same sort of process for making a sleep device. And so in would come the case, analog. Let's forget about digital for a second, analog. Yeah. We'd convert it to digital. We'd scan it in, and then in the software, especially special proprietary software that was developed for us, we would, and we tried other things, but we had to have special software made. We would design an oral appliance. And the thing we did that was very, very unique is A, we designed an appliance to be milled out of a puck. So there's no monomer. It's stronger. You can make it smaller. You can have more space for the tongue, all the kind of things you want. It's going to be more comfortable for the patient. So that was all going to be great. It could be extremely precise because you were working with it with tenths and hundreds of millimeters. You could actually work in microns if you wanted to. So we became the only device that was ever delivered. We deliver all our devices within 0.3 millimeters of the original starting position. And the others are between 1.3 and 5 millimeters from that spot because they're made by hand. Mm. And so we had some incredible precision, incredible fit, and no moving parts, no metal tubes, no jack screws. Instead, we made an iterative advancement device. And I remember seeing the device the first time and saying, uh, ho- holy crap. And they said, what? I said, um, wh- where's the turny screw thing? Uh, how, do you, how do you move the jaw on this? And he reached from behind his back, Sung Kim, the technology guy, reaches behind his back and pulls out two more arches. He says, you trade out one of these. And I said, what? He said, yeah, you start with these two arches. And when you want to move one millimeter forward, you take this lower arch out and you put a new lower arch in where the posts are in the same spot, but they, the mandibular platform is moved forward one millimeter. 
I said, that'll never work. He said, why not? I go, that's going to be so expensive to make four arches. And I'm thinking handmade, time, yeah, effort, yeah. model. And he goes, Mark, it's a puck of plastic and it's a hmm. milling machine and a burr. This costs peanuts. Yeah, I can make wow. four, six, eight, ten of these. The money is spent designing the device. And then you press, move it one millimeter forward, mill another one. Mill it a millimeter forward, move another one. Wow. And I went, holy shit. And then, and then we looked at one more thing. We looked at the posts. The posts were 90 degrees. And all the other sleep devices I'd ever seen had posts or screws or advancement arms that were all at 70 degrees because that's the normal angle that the mandible hangs down and opens along. So as you open your jaw, it moves about in a 70 degree arc as it opens around the hinge axis. And I said, well, why are these posts 90 degrees? <laughs> and I'm such an idiot. He said, that's what you asked for. And I said, I didn't, I didn't ask for 90 degrees. He said, yes, you did. I said, no, I didn't. What did I, what did I say to you? And he said, you told me that when you design the device, you should be able to hold the mandible at the therapeutic position, even if the patient's mouth hangs open at night while they're sleeping. And Mark, if I made those posts on a 70 degree angle, it would go as back. the mouth hangs open, the mandible would retreat. See, you went right there. Your mandible yeah. would retreat. You got that. And so by keeping it at 90 degrees, if the patient's mouth drops open at night, which it doesn't very much because the 90 degree post sort of creates some friction there. But if it did hang open, they'd at least still be positioned. The mandible would still be positioned anteriorly and they'd still be in a therapeutic position. And I just like with the palm of my hand hit my forehead and went, holy cow. Wow. I said one thing. And he heard it as an engineer and said, oh, you mean this. And so, again, the design was brilliant. We had this iterative device, milled platform, so much smaller. And and now we have made one where you can put a jack screw on it because some people still wanted that. We made one with a herb so it would be Medicare approved. So we've got a, a continuous advancement device called CA. And we've got a precision herbs, herbs called PH. But our IA and IA Select, which is just a little small one, are out there. And then, and then the new one that you're going to see this spring, it's FDA approved right now. So if anybody's listening to this, I don't know when this will be published, but if anybody's listening to it, they can look it up. The new product out will be called Evo and uh, still milled, still milled out of puck, but this time instead of PMA, it's a MG6 technology material. It's a proprietary material where it's got a little bit of flexibility. So it's a little bit forgiving because what we found was with that very precise platform, we had to have very precise impressions. Uh-oh, we're back to crown and bridge now yeah. for a second, aren't we? Oh, yeah. And I need this crown and bridge crown to fit on not one tooth, not three teeth, but 28 teeth. <sighs> Wow. And wrap the distal of the second molars. Ouch. So yeah. we would get alginate impressions or silginate impressions, and mostly they look like crap. And then once in a while, you get somebody who could take those impressions well. High five for that. I can't. So we really were insisting that doctors used a putty wash two-stage technique where they would use a putty, like Kettenbach uh -huh, putty, yeah. and they would have it completely set with a piece of saran wrap over the top, the same technique you use for Invisalign. Mm -hmm. Remove that, trim up the tray a little bit because you're really just making a custom tray, and then wash it with light body. And we would get spectacular impressions. And when you make it like that, the devices would drop in. We had studies that showed no tooth movement, fewer side effects. Everything about it was fantastic. But it did require a higher quality input from our providers. And so mm -hmm. even though it quickly became the number one selling device by prescription in the country, and the company grew millions and millions and millions of dollars overnight wow. and really took a huge market share from other companies. Yeah. There was still a limitation in terms of the abilities of that device because it was not flexible. And so this new material opens a whole new door. And the other thing about these types of devices is when physicians see these, they don't look all gunked up and stained like an old bike guard can or an old sleep device can that's made out of co -cure acrylic or a nylon printed. They don't have as many side effects. So physicians will like them and write more prescriptions for them. So we think that we're the company that's going to take sleep medicine from 5% market share for obstructive sleep apnea treatment to 15 or 20 mm. by changing wow. how you look at us. That's our goal. And that's super exciting. And it'll help everybody. It'll help every appliance company, but we'll be responsible for primarily making that change. I'm taking to the patient side of it. So how do you diagnose and like, how does a person even figure out what doctor to go to? Do they go to yeah. dentists or do they go to sleep doctors or like who, how do you diagnose that? And who do you go to? Now, that's a great question, Barb. And generally the historical path. So if we go backwards in time, the historical path was a patient at their primary care physician or at their heart specialist or, you know, at one of their doctors, the doctor might suspect that that patient had obstructive sleep apnea and send them for a sleep test. And traditionally, historically, a long time ago, that sleep test would mean that patient would end up going to a sleep clinic, sleeping overnight with a bunch of wires hanging off them, very yeah. difficult 
do, very challenging. And then, the, yeah, they'd have sleep apnea. And then almost 100%, almost every single one of those patients got a CPAP machine, which is a mask yeah. with a hose yeah. and a machine next to the bed. And here's the problem. 40% of the patients who get that wear it, and they wear it on average 4.5 hours a night, five nights out of seven. There's 100 studies that show that. So even though the treatment works really, really well, almost 100% of the time, because hardly anybody was wearing it, yep. it was not a very effective treatment because nobody could wear that device all night. If they got up at, at midnight to go pee or one in the morning to go pee, they generally didn't put their mask back on. And the second half of the night is more critical than the first half of the night. You have more episodes the second half. Mm. So it's a real problematical treatment. So along came oral appliances, but oral appliances were, you know, poorly designed. A guy like Keith Thornton had designed some really innovative devices, but you know, they were still handmade. They were still crappy. They were still large. You had to push the jaw further forward. There was a lot of acrylic taking up the tongue space. They, they were a mess. But it was better than, you know, we didn't have anything before. So they were they were coming along. So now you fast forward to today and in all but about four or five states, a dentist can order a sleep test and get hmm. the ball rolling. Okay. So yeah. the primary okay. care physician. But the only person who can read and interpret the sleep test and make the diagnosis in all 50 states is a sleep physician. And that could be a pulmonologist, a neurologist, or it could be an ENT. That's generally the three specialties that end up in sleep. So I can order a sleep test on a patient if I think they have sleep apnea. I can read the test results myself, but I can't interpret them and make a diagnosis. And then when my physician makes the diagnosis, and that physician could be a telemedicine visit today, or it could be a physician they see down the street from me, across the hall, wherever it mm -hmm. is. Once they see that physician, the physician could say, you have mild or moderate sleep apnea. And if it's mild or moderate, an oral appliance is indicated as well as a CPAP. Today, the patient and the physician has a choice of treating that mild or moderate patient with a CPAP or an oral appliance. If they are severe, that means 30 times an hour that they have an episode. That's a lot. By the way. Some have 60, 70, 80. Then they are supposed to try CPAP first. If they fail CPAP or refuse CPAP, then they can still try an oral appliance. So today, some patients go to the sleep physician first. Most of the tests are in home now, not in a clinic. 75% yeah. of in, uh, in home, you sleep with a home sleep test. There's a bunch of them out there and they're all good. And then the patient ends up with either an oral appliance. Now they, they could end up with weight loss as a diet as treatment. They could end up with sleeping on their side. A few people, that's a solution. Some people get Inspire and that's a, like a pacemaker thing over your heart and wires that run up to your tongue to keep it a little stimulated while you're sleeping. So there are some other treatments that are out there. Oral surgeons would pull the maxilla and the mandible forward, do what's called an MMA, mandibular maxillary advancement. That works about 95% of the time. So oral appliances don't work 100% of the time like CPAP does, but patients will wear them. And so for me, mild cases were about 90% effective, moderate about 80%, and severe patients were only 50-50. But 95% of my patients wear the device every night. Yeah. So even though I don't have the same efficacy, I have much better compliance or adherence. So the effectiveness is equal to or greater than CPAP. And so that's another reason the world is tipping from CPAP for everybody to, well, maybe more of these people should have oral appliances. So we're seeing a huge growth in that. And de more dentists are getting into it every day. There's still not a lot of dentists that do it. There's very few dentists that actually practice sleep. There are some dental laboratories that, as you know, are licensed or they're sold to license the manufacturing capability or an FDA manufacturing subsite, however they do that, so that they can make those devices. And so, um, and, and there are a few labs that have started to mill a uh, Great Lakes Orthodontics, which is now Great Lakes Dental, yeah. has, been milling, mm -hmm. has been milling bite splints for quite some time. A company called Dynaflex mills sleep devices. And so you can mill, but the problem is, are, do you, are you still milling with precision? Because just using CAD CAM without precision yeah. doesn't mean yeah. that it's any better. I'll tell you, Barb, how I was diagnosed with it. How I found out I needed to be tested was I got married. And <laughs> <laughs> and you had a you had a sleep snoring indicator yeah. every night in your room. And I told her I never snored before I met you. <laughs> wow. Awesome. That's awesome. So right, that's what so started I, my journey. I, I gotta dive deeper though, but explain to me, if you will, please, how does the device help a person sleep? I don't get it. So the average person lays down to go to sleep at night and gravity helps their tongue fall backwards into the back part of their mouth. Now, you would never do that when you're awake. You would never snore when you're awake. But we know that sometimes the tongue falls towards the back part of the throat because it relaxes. Mm -hmm. And when it does, it can some, sometimes let the air that's going uh, up the nose and down the air tube, it'll ripple past that tongue that's laying against those, you know, wet, moist, mucousy tissues, and it'll <sighs> make a little snoring sound. Snoring mm -hmm. in and of itself is not a problem. It's just a noise. But snoring might indicate that there's also a reduction in airflow. See, there's a big difference between snoring 
and sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. Now, truly, most people who have sleep apnea do snore, but we see a few that don't. And most people who snore do have sleep apnea, but we see a few that don't. So it's not snoring equals sleep apnea, but it, it is a high indicator. There's other things like age, sex, men, over 50, and overweight. Boy, those are three risk factors right there. And if you snore, that's wow. four. And that person with those four risk factors would be 90% likely to have obstructive sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. So somebody goes to bed at night, tongue falls back, closes off the airway. What other things factor into that? Well, it turns out that that little uvula, the thing that hangs down in the back of your throat, mm -hmm. and the epiglottis that protects your airway when you're swallowing, those two devices overlap in every single mammal mm -hmm. except for humans. What? In humans, they're separated because we elongated our necks when we walked upright and started communicating, and the larynx and the voice box and all that moved around. So when you look at infants, for example, during the first year of life, in the beginning of the first year, they overlap. By the end of the first year, they've separated as they begin to learn a little bit of speech and grow their larynx. Hmm. So no other mammal has sleep apnea. They might snore, but they don't have sleep apnea. We're the only ones that do. It gets worse. Because we don't eat and chew wild paleolithic diets anymore, our upper and lower jaws don't grow as large. We don't have room for our wisdom teeth. So our maxillary mandibular complexes are smaller, but the tongues didn't get any smaller because we still use them for speech. Most people are stuck with a, a size seven or eight tongue and a size five or six bony box for their jaw. So now we've got people that are overweight. We've got people with large tongues, small bony boxes, not enough room for their wisdom teeth. And then 20 years ago, we took four bicuspids out for orthodontics. Yeah. yeah. Mandible back and made it worse. I just had a phone consultation with a patient this morning, a telemedicine visit. And, and we're talking her through. And I said, so did you have ortho? And she goes, yeah. I go, do you have any teeth extracted? She goes, yeah. And I'm like, yep, there you go. So we made your bony box smaller for her, you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And now... No surprise, she's got sleep apnea. We would never do that today. Instead, we would grow that maxilla, make it wider, bring it forward. We would do something like that, rapid palate expansion and growth. So who are we blaming here? Evolution? Is that what I'm blaming? Oh, yes. <laughs> some of it's evolution, some of it's diet, some of it's weight loss. You know, in 1994, only one state had an obesity rate above 20%. Today, no state has an obesity rate under yeah. 30%. Yeah. Under 30%. And so we've gotten fatter as a nation. Our diets are crap. And so everything just makes it. So we're actually having, we have more people that develop sleep apnea every year than we're treating. We're losing, we're losing ground to that mm. disease. And it's not rare. It's 20 to 25% of the population, a billion people worldwide, a billion, 40 to 55 million in the U.S. alone. It's crazy. That is crazy. So the device, what? It holds the tongue? So, the, so all the device does is it's a mandibular repositioning device. And whether you use a jack screw on the side or a herbst arm, or in our case, those iterative posts, something holds the lower jaw, the mandible, in an anterior position. So, so in some countries, they call it a mandibular advancement device, a MAD, M-A-D, or a MASS, mandibular advancement splint. Usually in the U.S., we call it an oral appliance OA, but all those names are acceptable, but it's a mandibular forward repositioning splint with about three or four or five millimeters of vertical, depending on the device you're using. And when you pull the lower jaw forward, it pulls the tongue and associated structures forward. And for a lot of people, pulling that stuff forward when they lay back at night leaves the airway patent enough for air to flow. Huh. When you take that sleep test, it records your snoring. It also records your flow of air through your nose, and it records your blood oxygen levels. If your blood oxygen drops 3% and there's a reduction in flow that lasts eight seconds and 30% or more, that's called a hypopnea. If you stop breathing altogether, that's called an apnea. You add up the number of apneas, stop breathing, and the number of hypopneas, reductions in breathings per hour, and a normal healthy person sleeping through the night that doesn't remember getting up sleeps great is zero to five. Wow. And a person with mild is 5 to 15 times per hour, and a moderate patient is 15 to 30. That's me, about 20 times an hour. Mm -hmm. And somebody north of 30 is severe, and we see I've treated patients with 90. 90? And I've, I've treated patients with 90 with an oral appliance, gotten them down to 35. They feel remarkably better. They sleep better only get up to go pee once instead of four times. Their blood pressure medications are working better. All kinds of crazy good stuff but they still have severe sleep apnea, that patient still has to go back on a CPAP. The life expectancy for somebody with sleep apnea is about 6.7 years less than somebody without it. Patient with sleep apnea is four times more likely to have a stroke, 23 Jeez. times more likely to have a heart attack. Thanks. And we see much higher rates of arrhythmias, hypertension, diabetes, depression, congestive heart failure. So this disease is not the one disease we found that solves everything, but it's 
it's damn close. I mean, you look at this disease, you say it, it makes a lot of other things way worse for people. Wow. And you do see people with depression, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, all kinds of stuff without obstructive sleep apnea, but the coincidence is scary high. And of course, it's also scary high in a population that's overweight, in a population that's sedentary. So all of that ties together that if we sleep poorly at night, it's the media talks about, oh, there was a, a Hoboken train disaster or the Exxon Valdez or Judge Anton Scalia died at night of a heart attack or Reggie White, the football player. Those are all like sensational things to talk about on TV, but it's really the diseases that people are dying of every day. And it doesn't say on your death certificate that Elvis Dahl died of a obstructive sleep apnea. He died of a heart attack, right? Wow. Yeah. That's what it says. But the heart attack, he's 23 times more likely to have that because he had severe sleep apnea. Why? The strain. So I'm, I'm sleeping at night, right? And I'm supposed to be resting. Mm-hmm. And when I'm resting at night, my heart rate is around 40 to 45 beats per minute. When I am reduced in my airflow and I don't have enough oxygen coming in 20 times per hour if I'm not wearing my sleep appliance, what happens to my heart rate to make up for that lack of oxygen? What happens it to my heart rate? <laughs> and what happens to my blood pressure? Yep, goes up. Okay. So now I'm resting at 40 beats per minute and suddenly I'm at 110 beats per minute. My body, my heart thinks I'm pushing a car out of a snowbank. Mm. But I'm really sleeping. And it gets worse because I'm laying there resting and everything in my body says, you are not prepared to fight or flight. You are prepared to just rest and recover. And so I'm not in a very good position to get the right kind of things flowing in my body to take that increased heart rate and everything on. So it's, I'm much more at risk for a heart attack. It gets even worse. Wow. If I'm a snorer, I probably breathe through my mouth. And if I breathe through my mouth, I'm not breathing through my nose. Why is that important? Well, nasal breathing is the only way that humans make a little chemical called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is the active ingredient in the little blue pill for men for erectile dysfunction. It's also, and here we said we weren't going to get dirty in this talk. And here we go. <laughs> I like getting dirty. You know that. Yeah, there we go. So, and Mark started talking about penises. So, uh, so erectile dysfunction. So you treat that with nitric oxide. Well, forget about that for a second, but that, that it acts the same way. It's a vasodilator. We also, nitric oxide is the active ingredient in nitroglycerin that I put under your tongue if you think you're having angina yeah. pain or heart attack. Why? Because it's a vasodilator, not just down there in Mr. Happy Zone, but also in your heart. So if I'm a mouth breather and my heart's being challenged at night and I don't have enough nitric oxide floating around, I also don't have a very good response to that cardiovascular challenge and I'm more likely to have a heart attack. Damn, that's a great I know. explanation. It all yeah. comes down to the penis. So. <laughs> the or uh, up to the penis <laughs> so that's, that's how you understand men right that's how you understand men it's pretty simple exactly. if it wasn't for that all, nobody would care about this whole sleep apnea thing all nerve endings in there all thought processes <laughs> for me i made my first sleep device 20 no almost 30 years ago now i was gonna say 20 or 29 years ago but it's 30 years ago now teaching with keith thornton out the pen can stoop and they were crude they weren't adjustable. They looked like an upper impression tray with a handle sticking down and a flat plane on the bottom that you had to, you had to stick your mandible forward to get that handle back down so you could close together. And I treated some people and I treated some for snoring and I treated some for sleep apnea, but we did it without sleep tests. We did it without titration. We did it without working with physicians. It was horrible. And physicians didn't trust us because of that. Today, we would never do that. Hmm. And today we have better devices. We have better treatment, better testing, better pulse oximeters. I mean, heck, my Fitbit has a pulse oximeter. Yeah. My wife's... Um, Apple phone has a pulse oximeter. So we can monitor. I mean, every morning I get up, it's kind of funny. My wife will say, how'd you sleep? I go, I don't know. Let me check. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't answer until I see the data. <laughs> yeah. So you're not just a doctor. You're also a client. I am. Yeah. And I've worn every prototype of every device that we've ever made at Prosomnus and probably every device from every other manufacturer. Cause I test them all and we measure them size and everything like that. Cause we just want to keep making sure that ours is the smallest, the easiest to wear. And, you know, someone else will come out with some new device and they'll say, this is a game changer. And it's not, hmm. you know, they're just, it's this hype. Yeah. So I'm guessing you don't recommend the over the counter ones that you see. <laughs> so, but you know, it's an interesting point. So Elvis, here's what I would tell you. The over the counter ones hold the mandible forward. Yeah. But it's boil and bite, right? It's upper and lower boil and bite and some little hooky thing on the side yeah. to hold the jaw forward or a Zipa or something like that. The, you know, I like the one that's called Snore RX. That's a good one over the counter. But they're only going to last about 30, 60 days, maybe 90 days if you're really great about keeping them clean. So you're going to spend 100 bucks, and every 90 days, every three months, you're going to get a new one. 
and and you might be treating your snoring and your snoring gets better because you can't treat you can't treat sleep apnea with an over the counter device yeah. you can only treat snoring so you might treat snoring and your snoring might get better but you might still have sleep apnea and that's really scary because you'd go hey i'm not snoring anymore high five and you still die young yeah. of some comorbidity mm. damn so that's why a dentist cannot treat snoring unless the patient has a diagnosis from a sleep physician that says they do not have sleep apnea. Isn't that wow. interesting? Yeah. Yeah. Big time. As you were talking, I was like moving my jaw forward, trying to feel where my tongue goes and just kind of like uh, visualizing myself. I'm going to do with you and everybody who's listening a test that I do with all of my patients. That's not very many, by the way, <laughs> but all my patients I work a half day a week, all my patients. And I, I throw my arms out wide, both my patients. I do with both my patients. So lean your head back, pinch your nose and make a snoring sound. Everybody make a snoring sound. Yeah. Excellent. Now, pinch your nose, lean your head back, stick your jaw forward, and try to make that snoring sound. Feel the difference? <laughs> oh, that's it does cool. feel different. Isn't it's that cool. amazing? So yeah. I do that to the patients, and I say, so that's what I'm going to do with this appliance. I'm going to hold your jaw forward like that, and my goal is to find a, a position that's comfortable enough for your temporomandibular joints and muscles, and yet protruded enough to open your airway and try to balance those two things out. That's my goal. So the smaller devices advantage us to have less side effects. The precision devices advantage us to have straightforward protrusion rather than crooked protrusion. So there's some real advantages to what Prasomnus is doing. It's, I got to tell you, 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 you all have known me a long time. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and Barbara, if I count knowing your dad, I mean, yeah. he's known me practically all my, all my, my whole kind of life. Yeah. Yep. So, so you look back and you say, I've never hooked my wagon onto a bad horse. Yeah. And so this is a company that does things right. They do it better than everybody else. Nobody makes devices like we do. Nobody has the kind of precision and in, in everything that we do. And there's just there's just no trade-offs with the kinds of devices. And now that we have this new Evo material, it's even more exciting because that little bit of flexibility that we kind of need to be a little bit forgiving for an impression that's maybe not perfect. And, and your yeah. dentists, I'm sure, have never given you a bad impression. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. but uh -huh. it's, it's alleged to be the case that there's a case Occasionally, a less than perfect impression. It is a little bit forgiving. See, and that's that's a really big deal. Really big deal. Does intraoral change any of that? Intraoral scanning? Yeah, scanning makes it much better, just like it does for Crown and Bridge. Because two reasons: sure. one, you can see it on the big screen when you're when you're scanning the tooth, so that's helpful to see. You know, oh, my margin looks like <laughs> there, and they go back and reprep it. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully. But for me, yeah, when hopefully. I'm gathering the data, I'm scanning too, and so the the data that I'm gathering when I'm scanning, you know, there's this green red thing on my scanner. And then, and the red says, you don't have enough data here. Now yeah. it will fill it in. Okay. And so if I was doing a crown on tooth number 14 and I had all nice green data there and I had some red blotches on the buckle of 15 and 12, who gives a shit, right? Just done. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. Send it in. You don't care if the yeah. buckle's bulky on one tooth, as long as you got the prep and you got the occlusion, we could get away with that. Even though I, I don't do quadrant impressions, I've never done that. I've always been a full arch guy, but that's a different deal. But you could get away with that. You can't get away with it here. You got to have green everywhere. And so it's really interesting as you're, as you're taking the scans and they have to be full arch scans. You have to get all the hard tissue, a little bit of the soft tissue so you can get the bite together. And you got to take a very special protrusive bite and everything like that using a George gauge. And so you're, you're getting all that data in. And it's funny because you see the green, green, and there's places where you have red and you're like, oh crap, I got to go fix that. And you know, you have to, because otherwise the device isn't going to fit well, or it might fit well, yeah. but now it's like three more minutes of my time here. And I don't have to worry about how it's going to fit down the road. Yeah. That to me, that's peace of mind. So when you get the scan in with the upper and lower, you move that forward 70% in the software before you make the device? No, we actually record a bite. I just did a paper for the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine on a series of 67 cases in a row. My average bite recording position for a patient based on comfort and the mm -hmm. snoring test that I just did with you, trying to find the right spot, and I can't always find the right spot, is 50.3% of their protrusive oh, range from most retreated to most protrusive. Yeah. And it's usually about three millimeters of opening in the incisal and mm -hmm. in the posterior. So I've got about three millimeters of vertical room. That's all I need for a Prasomus device. And I'm about 50% of the range of motion and my average mm -hmm. and 36% of the people resolve there. 80% resolve within two millimeters. And my average mm -hmm. advancement is 1.29. I happen to know all that data because I just wrote the paper. And my average reduction in AHI score was 76%, which is a little bit better than the industry average for oral appliances. It's probably around 68 or 69%. And most prosomnus mm -hmm. studies come up around 70 to 72%. I got 76%. Is it statistically different? Probably not. 
but I, I think the combination of snore test and patient comfort is why I, I have such good success. I yeah. also don't have anybody that's discontinued use because of side effects. Have I pulled off an occasional crown with hard acrylic devices? Yes. We re cement them. Have we had patients who had jaw soreness? Of course. What do we do? Move them backwards and then come forward again. Okay, great. <laughs> have we had anybody that we broke a device on? Yes. I had two devices break out of the last maybe 100 and couple that I've done. And the good thing is I've got four arches, so I can usually grind on the post of one of those arches and make that the same dimension of another device that they have so that they're never out of treatment. Mm -hmm. And I just call Prosomnus, actually I email them, they press a button and remill as part of the warranty, remill one of the devices that uh, needs to get fixed. Wow. So it's really, really slick. So the, the whole idea is not to move the bottom jaw out as far as it can go. That's not the Correct. answer. Oh, Correct. So you're finding about halfway between the farthest. I would say most treatment resolution is found between 50 and 70% of the range of motion of the mandible going forward. And with other devices, it might be 60 to 80%. And that extra 10% that you have to go because of the bulk of the other devices opens the door for more TMJ, muscle, ligament, soreness, and yeah. sensation that you don't like. And then you have to worry about when the patient gets up in the morning, their back teeth don't touch because their mandible's down and forward for eight hours and the jaw joint's filled with fluid. So we make them a little wedgy plastic thing called a morning occlusal guide or a MOG that helps remind them where to put their jaw back in its normal position. So they got to squeeze on that and get the water out of their joints. Yeah. And that takes five to 15 minutes to an hour. Everybody's a little different to get your bite back in the morning. Otherwise you develop, you could develop a permanent posterior open bite if you didn't do that hmm. oh that's crazy really yeah, it is. yeah. but they'd have a yeah. more pronounced chin though i mean yeah it looked more like uh marilyn, <laughs> marilyn monroe or uh yeah. charlton Heston. there you go yeah. <laughs> handsome handsome very handsome <laughs> so when you're trained so you're actually not necessarily training dentists you're are you working with yeah. other yeah. Physicians? I do work with other physicians, but I'm actually training dentists. Okay. The American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine is kind of the go-to group. There's other very excellent groups like American Sleep and Breathing Association. I'm a member of that too. I'm also a member of the a couple of physicians groups, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the American Academy of Cardiovascular mm -hmm. Sleep Medicine. But those are the two biggest groups, the ADSM and the ASBA for dentists for sleep. The ADSM is the, the big doggy. They got about 4,000 members. Now remember there's 180,000 dentists Okay. and about 4,000 members. So maybe there's 6,000 dentists, maybe there's seven or eight. I don't care, but there's probably five or 6,000 dentists who dabble or do something in sleep. Mm -hmm. That's three or 4%. <laughs> so, wow. so, this is a, so I used to talk about how labs were a pimple on an elephant's butt in terms of healthcare, because we're a small percentage of dentistry. We're seven or 8% of dentists expenses, right? Mm -hmm. And then dentistry is about 5% of medicine. <laughs> and so like, you're like, we're this pimple on a pimple. We're this, you know, this tiny, we're a tiny little thing. This, this is even smaller because Jeez. so, you know, there's probably at best a hundred million dollars worth of oral appliances sold from manufacturers to dentists on an annual basis. And, you know, you can picture the size of the laboratory industry, you can picture the size of dentistry, you know, $120 billion. So we are really, really small. So I've moved from dentistry into the lab community, a smaller industry, because that way I could be a bigger fish in a little pond. <laughs> and now I'm a big fish in a puddle. Wow. A little puddle. And I'm flopping around in the puddle and everybody goes, oh, everybody knows Mark Murphy. Well, yeah, there's only about five of us, you know. Yeah. <laughs> So there's about 6,000 dentists who do sleep, and I'd say most of them have heard of me or read one of my articles or seen me lecture or something. And then there's probably five or 600 who really do a lot of sleep. The average dentist is still busy doing dentistry, and then he fits in one patient a week or one patient a month doing dental sleep medicine because it pays better than anything else they do in their practice. What is the risk involved in a dentist doing sleep? Like what would they be afraid of? Yeah, they would be afraid of side effects. They would be afraid of changing the bite or tooth movement. So they should use better devices. They would be afraid of getting sued if a patient died. They should be more afraid of getting sued if they didn't screen patients and tell them they did need to get a sleep device or a CPAP or something, that'd be a greater error because now that the ADA has resolved that we're supposed to be screening patients for that, that's a responsibility we have. They also could be at risk if they don't keep good soap notes and somebody doesn't have a good time, you know, in terms of having their treatment, everything like that. But it's a lot easier than dentistry. I think it's a lot less risky than dentistry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot more rewarding than dentistry. And it's, think of it, it's like putting in an upper and lower bite splint where you got both of the bite splints have flat planes that match. Yeah. And so it's way easier to adjust. There's none of this. You, there's no adjustment. I, I can't remember in the last hundred sleep devices I did, 
I don't think I adjusted one of them occlusally. Wow. Well, they don't occlude, awesome. right? <laughs> I mean... Yeah. So if I took if I took good impressions and a good bite, and I do, you know, but and, and maybe a little bit better than the average, but I take a good bite, yeah. good impressions, I send it in, the lab sends it back. If those occlusal surfaces mate on the models, I know they're going to mate in the mouth. Yeah. And for some, it's really the only company that mounts every single case, every single case on an articulator. Really? Wow. They don't come in that way, but that's how we mount them to keep the interact relationship safe. And then if we have to open it, we're opening it kind of in the radius that might be closer to that patient's mouth than just guessing on a small barn door or hinge articulator. Yeah. So there's a lot of, again, we, we're crazy nuts there about precision. Crazy nuts. What kind of articulators do you guys do? Large adjustable, obviously. They use, they use Stratos. Yeah, that's what I use. That's my fave. And where are you guys located? They're in East Bay, California, Pleasanton, California. So just east of San Francisco a little bit. So they're really close to where Microdental was. We spun out of Microdental and we literally went right down the street. <laughs> and Microdental was in Dublin and we spun out to Pleasanton, California, which is maybe three miles away from where Microdental was. Then Microdental moved from Dublin to Livermore. So they moved about 12 miles down the road. Mm. So okay. it was still very close. It's a really interesting business. It's a really interesting business model because we still have several of the same challenges that the laboratory industry has. We're reliant on garbage in, garbage out, right? So yeah. good inputs yeah. in, good inputs out. So we need good impressions to make good devices. No question about that. So that's the same as you've always had on the lab side. And then we've still got all the same stuff. Like there are devices you could buy that are uh, $350. And there are devices that you could buy that are $700 and lots of numbers in between. And so, oh my gosh, well, there was a race to zirconia, not because it was the most beautiful material you've ever seen. Monolithic zirconia would never have been successful if Emacs was priced the same or if gold didn't go up so high. Sure. Yeah. Monolithic zirconia was a, a monetary play, not a, oh, I like it because it's stronger. Oh, yeah. No, it looks like crap. So, I mean, <laughs> we've all worked hard to make it look decent, you know, yeah. and, and now that we've got some more translucency in it and some stuff like that, we can get by. And for the posterior, it's fine. But I mean, I, I never have done in my life, and I haven't done Nestrian in a while, but I've never done a monolithic zirconia crown. I've done some Emacs. You know, and when I read it, my wife, my wife had a museum in her mouth of different kinds of materials and PFMs and gold crowns and stuff like that. So when we did all our molars, we did it all on Emacs and it turned nice. out great. And then nice. she had one short, spidey little tooth that it kept coming off. So we finally did, we redid, actually the guy that bought my practice redid it. I didn't do it. He redid it in a uh, full gold crown. So she has one full gold crown in her oh, mouth wow. on an upper second molar <laughs> just because. There's just so little retention. It just do that and feather edge it. It fits great now. So. Well, how much goes into cosmetically making sleep devices look decent? Do, do people care? Wow, I wish this was a virtual online webinar and I could show you pictures of how they look uh, after time and how they gunk up. You cannot imagine how some of these devices look in six or 12 months or two or three years. Yeah. And because ours are, uh, we've got these electromicrographs that are in some of the articles we've produced showing our device against others. This control cured PMA, just like a control cured, PMMA for dentures just doesn't gunk up. It doesn't stain. Yeah. And so it looks brand new four years later. Yeah. And these other devices don't. And the nylons, for example, the printed nylon devices like Panthera makes, which, and, and they have pretty good accuracy, by the way. I, I think that's the second best device out there. And, and I hope that Kim Solomon's listening and hears me say something good about them because I love that guy to death. And so uh, if Kim hears me, I love you, brother. But they're still their nylon and they take up stain like you cannot believe. And yeah, so- that makes sense. Yeah. And theirs is a great small device. For a long time, it was my second, my go-to device is my second device. If I had a patient that was sensitive to acrylic or worried about veneers in the front or something like that, I always went right to a Panthera. That was my, my go-to second device. Now with our flexible device, I probably won't be ordering anything else from Kim, or at least mm -hmm. not as often. And uh, he'll be bummed. And I always liked working with him anyhow. He's a good guy. Yeah. You all remember Kim? Oh, sure. We had him on the podcast. Him and yeah, the I was a while say, ago. We, we yeah. Oh, that's right. I saw that on there. Our, our vice president of sales is Jerry Vogel, who was nice. with Nobel. Thank you, Jerry. Right. So, wow. In fact, he was texting me while we're talking right now. I owe him a phone call back this morning. So So I got a COVID question for you. Can we, can we segue? Elvis, are you good? Absolutely. Yeah. I swear, Mark, you and your wife, she's amazing. So you guys <laughs> were... I swear, I looked forward every single week on Facebook to you guys doing your uh, awesome songs and things like that. Tell me a little bit about that. How do you guys come up with that? I mean, you have so many wigs and so many clothes. <laughs> WTH, like you guys were amazing. WT, no, WTF, what the heck. Anyhow, um, so when COVID hit, we were, I traveled in March. I, I got home in March. I canceled a trip on March 
13th, Friday the 13th. I was supposed to leave on the 11th and didn't go to California for that trip. And we were home and hunkered down. And I've always played guitar and drums a little bit, and not very well, but I've always putzed around a little bit. <laughs> so one day we're, we're sitting around and I took, I think it was uh, Imagine or something like that. And I, and I went to play it and, and I've always done like funny words to songs like, you know, uh, Madonna. I can't even think of the real words, but I always call it, ooh, oh, material girl. I'd say breakfast cereal girl. And I'd sing that to my daughter. Because <laughs> when she get up in the morning, she'd always want to eat right away. And then Phil Collins, Sue Studio, I'd say Sue Sue Me Now. And I put some words <laughs> for a funny dental song. So in the back of my mind, I've always been that kind of person. That yeah. I'm not, uh, who's the goofy guy with the long curly hair? Weird Al. Weird Al. I'm not as good as Weird Al, but I yearn to be him someday. <laughs> so I've had that in the back of my mind and, and COVID came along. And so the, I wrote some funny lyrics about the COVID thing. And she said, oh man, you had to put that up. So I, so I did it. And if you remember, if you, if you remember way, way back, the very first one we did was me playing guitar into the camera, singing and singing these stupid lyrics. And I don't care that I don't sing very well. And that's all right. It's being funny and not being serious. Yeah. There are some artists out there who do these and they're serious and they're really good. Yeah. And then I did another one like that. And it wasn't like the next day or anything. I did another one like that. And then the next one, I said, you should do this with me. And she said, Are you? no, I'm not going to do that. And I talked her into doing it with me and she kind of liked it. <laughs> then I had an idea for the next day and we did another one the next day. And that's when it starts. We had like a day and then a couple days oh, off. Yeah. And, a day. and then we went 68 straight days. Oh my God. It was great. <laughs> you did one every day for 68 days. Yeah. Oh my and, gosh. Uh, I didn't even realize. You should see some of these. We got very theatrical with some of them as Barbara was Oh, uh, I saw saying. a lot of them. They were hilarious. <laughs> we did wigs and stuff like that. We did Bohemian Rhapsody with a dark oh, yeah. background behind <laughs> us. And my wife had, her mom wore wigs and she's had a couple of funny wigs. So we had a bunch of goofy wigs. Oh, yeah. We have a tickle trunk for the grandkids to dress up and play in. And some of it's old stuff we had and old stuff her folks had. So we had a pretty extensive, we call it a tickle trunk. And we, we didn't go out and buy anything except my daughter for my wife's birthday bought her a bunch of props in a package for like 50 bucks or something yeah. from Amazon that we got with fake microphones and stuff. I had my wife's purple robe on when oh, I was... Yeah. <laughs> and, and I couldn't even get my arms in it, you know, it's hilarious. And then we had this funny red beard that was like an Irish red beard. And so she wore that and she was the drummer when we did Mississippi Queen. Oh, and I and I wanted more cowbell baby and that kind of thing. He was great. <laughs> and we would we would make stuff up. And so what happens is I would say that of the sixty or so that we did. I would say I wrote 20 of the songs. She wrote 20 of the songs and 20 of them we worked on together. And if you can imagine during the week, we'd get ideas and we'd jot them down. So we'd have a working list of possible songs. And when the weekend came, we'd be rewriting the lyrics. And then when Sunday got around, we'd film, we'd try to film all seven of them on Sunday so oh, we could have whoa. them going out every day of the week. And Great. then a couple of them we did, Berkston, Fauci, with a Zoom meeting with the White I House. I remember movie. that one too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I did Pinball Wizard, where I had that goofy wig on and goofy scarf. And I tell you. My favorite was, was when she dressed me up as one of the Golden Girls, <laughs> and we sang Thank You for Being a Friend. And I got kind of accustomed to being in that dress and the lipstick. <laughs> and I like that. I think I think there's a little something going on inside me. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> it got us through a really rough time. I loved it. It was really, really cool. You know what was great? I, I there, there isn't anything good I could say about COVID. And there isn't anything great I could say about the last few days and, and how we've seen some behavior in the country and everything. But I can say this, that COVID taught me that the high school girl that I met and married is somebody I can spend a lot of time with in retirement mm -hmm. and that she's still my best friend. And, and it taught me that I don't have to be on an airplane every week because I fly 120, 30,000 miles every year for yeah. 15 years. And I could be home and still be happy. And it taught me that I like playing golf a lot more than I thought I did. And so uh, that's cool. Really good learning experience for me. I learned some things about myself. Now I've, I'm working harder for Prosomnus now than I've ever probably worked in my life. And I'm on Zoom meetings and calls and the responsibilities I have are ginormous, it seems. And, and I really appreciated Jason reaching out and suggesting me to do this with you all because yeah. I've been a bit disconnected from the laboratory side of dentistry and it's meant so much to me. Barb, people like your dad and leadership at the NADL. Mm -hmm. It's been a wonderful, wonderful 20 year journey away from dentistry onto the lab side. I could never go back the same way. I, I'm not the same person and I've really enjoyed it and the people. I'm still friends with so many of them. And it's just weird to not be at a Vision 21 meeting know, and, and yeah. not be on this committee and not be on, on meetings. And, and I got to hang around with Ricky Braswell a little bit longer because she was down at Panky for a while. So I got to stay in touch with her. Yeah. But I missed teaching at NADL University. I, That's where I, I saw you. Yeah. You're a rock star. I wrote in JDT online for 
from the inception of the online version for like eight straight years, didn't miss a, a month. So I miss, I miss that world a lot, but I'm, I've just been so busy lately. Well, you're one of my personal heroes. So thank you. Thank you so much. When I first started learning about the industry outside of the lab I work in and my owner started taking me to lab day and vision 21. Very. Yeah. Very, right? Yeah. And Cal lab and all that. I remember you were the first person I saw that really made me think, wow, this, this is pretty cool. This is, <laughs> this is some really good stuff. And then when I did NADL university, you get that better connection because it's a smaller class. It was outstanding. Yeah. And you're right. It's just all of a sudden you're not around anymore. <laughs> Yeah, it's been weird. In 2016, it got the last four years have been crazy since we spun out of Micro Dental. It's been a crazy, crazy run, and I was very fortunate because last fall, Len came to me and asked me to take a full time position again this year. He needed a little bit more of me, and I said yes. And oh, I, I won't say reluctantly, but I really liked what I was doing, and I liked lecturing and teaching. And I had this blend of made a little bit of money working for Prosomnus as clinical education director, mm -hmm. and then I made money lecturing and teaching, doing all this stuff, and I was free to do kind of whatever I wanted. So I took a full-time role and I actually technically started that February 1st and then COVID hit. So all my lecture stuff went away. I probably made 10% this year of what I would normally make lecturing and teaching and consulting. Sure. I, I would give a lot of the money back. You know, I, I gave over $20,000 to the foundation for dental laboratory technology. And, and I gave a lot yeah. of that money back from honorariums I earned lecturing in the lab industry. Yep. And it was funny. If I didn't have that full-time job with Prasoutness this year, I'd be screwed. Mm. I wouldn't have any income coming in. So I've told Len, I said, you know, he's been my savior this year, asking me back in a full-time role right at a time when uh, COVID hit. So he tried to renegotiate a lower contract and I told him no. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he did not. He's Do you yeah. see speaking engagements starting to book again or is that still holding off? So Hanman, I'm going to go up for a hands-on course that I'm doing there Oh, cool! in March. They're doing a hybrid uh, version. It wouldn't surprise me if they switch from hybrid to all virtual by the time it gets yeah. here. Yeah. Almost, Nothing else is live and in person. Yeah. A large group called Smile Source of about 700 practices just moved their April exchange to the fall, hoping that it'll be live in the fall. But I did one lecture in Kansas City during COVID. It was July. Uh, we were in a 400-person ballroom. There were 65 people spread out at tables, if you can imagine that. Two big screens. Wow. It looked like a huge auditorium with nobody in it. It was weird. Yeah. But I think there'll be some things like that. I know a few people that have done some in-person lectures, and they all spread out, but it doesn't feel the same. I think most of 2021, and if anybody, uh, you might not have seen it, but I posted some videos about COVID during COVID, keeping people up to date. The prediction is dentistry will not get back to 100% till maybe 2022. Dentistry is at 75 to 80% of their normal capacity and revenue, mm -hmm. and they have higher cost of business. And so they're getting hammered. And, and yeah. so are labs, right? Everybody's getting hammered. I'm not saying everybody isn't. We did really well at Psalm, surprisingly. You know, we, we took a dip like everybody else, but our fourth quarter got us back ahead year over year and we had a record December and it's crazy. So, you know, but, but of course we're the medical side rather than the dental side. So it's a little bit easier for us to rebound perhaps, mm -hmm. but we don't see dentistry really coming back. We don't see education maybe coming back, maybe Q3, Q4. We've got to have enough of the population vaccinated that our comfort level is there because yeah. it's hard to do a hybrid course. You've got the cost of all the online stuff and then you still have the cost of all the in-person stuff. And very few groups have enough money to try and pull it off on both sides. Yeah. And so I think you're going to see everybody just write it off. We had to write off most of last year. I think they're going to write off at least half of this year, maybe in the fall, but it wouldn't yeah. surprise me if it was 2021. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. yeah. I get my vaccine next Wednesday, so I'm pretty excited. There you go. <laughs> well, Mark, man, that was a quick and fascinating hour all about Elvis sleep Marvel. man that was amazing we appreciate it it's good stuff it was extremely easy to talk to both of you uh you're wonderful interviewers you let me ramble when i was rambling thank you for that um, <laughs> thanks for the opportunity if you ever want me back to talk about anything else keep me in the in between the ditches and talk about lab management i'm, ha I'm happy to do that someday i did do one lecture this year a virtual lecture for the lab lodge on lab management today. So I still have those slides. I still have some of that expertise, but I can't say that I have any hands-on uh, management of that for the last couple of years. Well, I hope to see you live again sometime soon. I really, really enjoy watching you. You're an amazing lecturer. So interesting and funny. It's amazing. <laughs> so, funny, but you. looks aren't everything, right? Funny, but looks <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, it's you good talking. To yeah, Mark, appreciate it. <laughs> Another voice from the bench, Mark Murphy. Signing off there here. You go. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Thanks. Peace, everybody. Bye. Yeah, Bye. we'll talk to you soon. Gotcha. Bye. Bye. 
Whitmix is very excited to announce the new Pro 4K large format 3D printer from Asiga. The open material printer for the 385NM and the 405NM resins features renowned Asiga reliability and super fast print mode for large batch printing of virtually all print resins. It's ideal for printing any kind of model, denture, splints, surgical guide, impression trays, and more. As it does with other Asiga printers, the Pro 4K features the SPS Smart Positioning System technology which ensures that the build platform is in the correct position when forming each layer, providing accuracy and continuity. The Asiga 4K DLP printer is affordable, so you can own it for under $25,000. It has a large build plate and is available in both the 65 micron and the 46 micron resolution versions. For more information about the Asiga Pro 4K, visit Whitmix.com or call Chris Fry at 513-680-1512. And as always, we appreciate your support of the podcast, Whitmix. Thank you, Mark Murphy, for coming on our podcast and scaring us all awake. That is crazy, the amount of people that have had some form of sleep apnea. We know that sleep devices are becoming more and more a large part of our industry, and it's good to know that we have friends of Dental Labs working on that side of dentistry. If you want to check out sleep devices that he was talking about on the podcast, head over to prosumnus.com and see all of the great technologies they have come up with. Seriously, though, what Mark and his wife did on Facebook during the early days of the pandemic was a great distraction. I watched it every single time. They were just hilarious, and they have way too many clothes and way too many wigs. <laughs> hilarious and creative to see what those two did every day. So thank you, guys. Awesome. Well, that's all we got for you, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. See ya. Have a good one. Bye. What is high of 13? Oh, that's the temperature this weekend.